So let's talk about the ext2 file system. Uh, before we talk about the, uh, the file system, let's look at the Linux boot process and how that works. Um, when we first um, boot our Linux system, uh, it, it uh, loads into something called a bootloader. And a bootloader is uh, code that's written into the, the master boot record area, which will be the first 512 uh, K of, um, of a hard drive that allows us to select which operating system we're going to run. So what this allows us to do is to run uh, various uh, different file systems and operating systems. And so you can have a, uh, a bootloader that allows you to select from um, running FreeBSD or some variation of Linux or Windows or any other um, system that runs um, on the, the box on which you're running. And just to give us an example of that, let's take a look at the uh, bootloader. So what we're going to do here is we're going to um, look at the bootloader for Linux. And this is called Grub, which is the Grand Unified Bootloader. There's also one called uh, the Linux Loader. It's also known as Lilo, and what this shows us is that we have uh, various kernels that we can boot from here. We can also, uh, if we had installed uh, Windows under Linux, it would allow us to boot from Linux from Windows. <coughs> and what you would see here, if you did that, is that down here, somewhere below this or above this, it, it would allow us to boot into Windows. Um, I've gone as far as triple booting, which would allow me to boot into some version of uh, Linux. In fact, occasionally I've had several versions of Linux in which I could boot and uh, Windows or FreeBSD. And so all of this code will be in the first 512K, which is uh, the master boot record of the disks. And uh, from here, what it allows you to do is to go to the boot, the boot process for each operating system that you have installed on here. If you ever want to, um, to dual boot, you should always uh, install Windows first because Windows has a nasty habit of writing its own code over the master bootloader and um, and so what we would do first is is we would install Windows and then we would install all the other uh, versions of uh, Linux or Unix we wanted to, to um, install after that and those uh, understand they would actually during the ins installation process look at to see if there's other operating systems loaded on your computer and if there were it would it would actually give you the opportunity to to install multiple bootloaders on here. And so anyway, what we're going to do here is we're going to uh, first boot up into Fedora. And this shows you some, the first thing this does is when we're booting into Linux, is just uncompressing, is first creating a RAM disk, um, which then allows you to, uh, if you can see right here that the, uh, the BZ image is at the Linux kernel, is actually uh, zipped up to decrease the uh, the size of it. Here's the initial RAM disk that is being created. It's an image. And then um, everything starts being loaded into the RAM image, the RAM drive. And then after that, we're going to go to this screen, but we want to see the more specifics of it. And the first thing, come on, we want to show the details here. There's various run levels associated with Linux, starting with run level zero, which is to, to stop the uh, operating system from running. Uh, notice it says entering run level. Right here it says run level 5. Uh, the first run level is for super user mode, and super user mode means you can get in and change anything you want. You're actually running as root. And, um, and uh, 2 is not used. Uh, 3 actually is for um, multiple users and um, also for networking, but it doesn't give you a graphical user interface. And then when it boots up into 5, it's giving you what you see here is the graphical user interface. So run level 1 is for super user mode. And um, uh, if somebody's able to do that and get in and run in super user mode, they have full access to your hard drive and everything that's on it. Uh, however, they won't have networking available. Uh, run level 3 is for, um, it's for multiple users again. It also gives you networking. And run level 5 is the same as run level 3, but also gives you the capability of running in graphical user interface mode. And so here we can go in and we can actually uh, give our username and password here. 
to log into our account. And then if you want to see all the details of everything that occurred during boot mode, we'll get in here and we'll open up a terminal window. <coughs> Just a second. By the way, this virtual um, program is called Parallels, which can be downloaded. You can need to uh, Google for that. But it's $49, and they have versions for Windows and uh, the Mac OS, and it's really a um, it's really a nice program, and it allows you to run multiple versions of operating systems on your Windows box. Now, if we want to see what happened during the, the boot process. We can type D message. Well, let's type D message in less, and it tells you everything that occurred. Notice that this says it's um, this is actually starting to write up after um, the initial RAM disk has been created and everything's been loading into RAM. Notice that it checks a lot of the hardware right here to make sure it's okay. It uh, checks to make sure um, a lot of the resources are available. It shows you where the uh, kernel command line where this is being. Um, um, mounted the, uh, the root file system. A lot of this stuff may be of no use to you. I will say that if you ever have a problem with uh, booting Linux, it's that uh, you can go into dmessage and check to see uh, what the problem is or whether, um, or if there are any problems, you can go in here and type forward slash and search for error or failure. Or anything like that to determine if um, why something is not loading, and we'll just go on down here and we'll see some of the things that have been uh, loaded. Notice the RAM disk driver has been initialized right here. The IDE controllers have been identified. Notice it's identified HDA and HDB right in here. And so, if you want to see. Uh, from a forensic standpoint, what somebody's running, what services they've been running, you can do this. This is one way of doing this. Notice it says it says ext3 file system. It's mounted with ordered data mode. It talks about secure enhanced Linux, which we won't talk about in here, but that's an NSA program that allows for uh, stringent access control. It's a really li relatively new addition to Linux. Notice that it's identified ETH0 as a Realtek RTL8029 NIC right here, as well as the um, MAC address associated with that. It looks at the, the sound system right here. It's got the floppy drive. It's identified USB host controllers right here. This is all US, USB information located in here. And we go on down, see if there's anything else installed. NetFilter is going to be our um, and IP tables is our firewall, so that's being registered and being installed. It's just got Bluetooth, and there's nothing else in uh, in here. One thing that you might come across um, as an investigator or as an examiner is you're at the scene of of a potential crime, and somebody has got uh, something like this on the screen. What I've done is I've hit. Whoops! Come on. Control Alt F1, and so what you would see on the screen is there's nothing but a command line. And if you see this on the screen, this doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have a graphical user interface. It means that they've um, gone into a virtual console, and the way to do that is hitting Control and Alt and F1, F2, or F3. So that drops you into a virtual console from which you can go out and actually. Um, from the command line, do any kind of administrative work you need to do. To flip back into the graphical user interface mode, you hit Control Alt and F7, and it takes you right back. Let's, let's hit Control Alt F2, it takes you back there. Notice that I can log in once again as root or any other. And then if I type um, F8, Control Alt. F8, come on. Here we go. Control F7 takes me back to my original login into um, the X Windows system. If I type who is logged in, notice that PC is logged in and root is logged in twice on once on TTY1, 
the terminal 1 and terminal 2. And we know this if I go back to control alt F1, here I am right here. We type in who, if I type exit here, and uh, I've exited out. And let's go back to here and type who again. Now recall that I, uh, I got into um, two different consoles. And so I'm running as root in one virtual console and I'm running on, uh, I'm logged in as PC in the X Windows system. So it tells you a little bit about the, uh, the boot process. Let's go over a little bit more over this in the notes. <clears throat> so uh, again, Lilo is the old boot manager. It can start two or more operating systems. And um, if, if Lilo is, um, and it, it looks a little different. It looks, it looks more like a, um, less like a graphical user interface loader than, than the Grand Unified bootloader. And if you want to see what the configuration is in Etsy Lilo, that's where you see the information on um, what's being load, what can be loaded from the uh, from the Lilo interface um, under Fedora and um, and Red Hat. The standard Linux loaders, the Grand Unified bootloader, just call it Grub. It's more powerful than Lilo. There's actually a command line interface behind it which you can use. You need to learn that though. Um, both Lilo and the Grub. Re, uh, reside in the first 512k which is the master boot record and uh, you can start uh, either in Lilo or Grub start operating systems either from the command line or from menu driven and there's bootloaders for uh, for um, BSD and Solaris and other operating systems as well okay the Linux boot process let's get back to that so the first thing that happens is instruction code and firmware is loaded into RAM and so the instruction code then checks the hardware and loads the boot program as we saw before in the boot program is that initial RAM disk that loads up the initial RAM disk is part of that which allows the operating system and the kernel to boot and the boot program does a couple of things first thing it does is it loads our kernel which you saw the kernel version down here and of course to look at the kernel version on a Linux system uh, you type uname dash a and it tells you what kernel we're running and when it was compiled and for what system in i686 GNU Linux. Go back here and then the boot program transfers control to the kernel which then means that the operating system is up and running. Again uh, when the kernel boots the first thing it does is it boots the system into single user mode and there's a way to actually get in and specify that on startup. And, um, and once that starts, uh, you boot it in a single user mode, then the startup scripts run. And the startup scripts are contained in the Etsy directory, and one of those is init tab. There we go. And we'll take a look at what's contained in init tab. Uh, and so this is read by the, uh, the kernel. It tells you the different run levels here. Zero is halt. Um, one is single user mode, uh, two is multi user without the network file system, three is full multi user mode with networking, four is unused, and five is for x11. Uh, six is for reboot. Notice that the default is run level five, which means it boots into um, X Windows. System initialization, all the other uh, f um, services that are going to be run and started up are going to be started from this directory, etcrc.drc.sys in it. Down here, um, notice that uh, this traps the control alt delete, which, which asks you whether you want to shut down or not, right here. And this is what happens in the standard run levels. What gets started up, one, two, three, four, five, six, is you get a terminal. Recall that um, when we typed, uh, let's do this again, who? Notice that TTY we saw before root was running on TTY1 and TTY2. So if we ran, um, if we did, they opened up a virtual console with Control Alt uh, F1, F2, or F3 all the way through F6, we see that we have these terminals that are started TTY1 through TTY6. Uh, down here, once it, um, we hit run level 5, it runs X11, which then allows us to run our, um, our graphical user interface. Come on, 
It's a little slow running back and forth. Okay, then the startup scripts run. It changes to multi-user mode. It identifies the root directory, the swap, and the dump files. It sets the host name and the time zone, which uh, went by very quickly on the screen. It runs a consistency check on the file system and mounts the partitions, and we've already talked about how that occurs. Uh, it, runs, it checks to see if the file system is clean. If it's not, it does uh, it runs FS check on it. If it's an EXT2 file system, if it's an EXT3 file system, which contains journaling, then it goes in and looks for the consistency and goes back and cleans everything up. Mounts the partitions and it starts services, which are located in the um, init.d. And these are the various things can be start uh, services that can be started or stopped. If we want to see what's on at the moment, we can type check config dash list. And if you remember from your Linux class, this tells us the different run levels zero through six right here. It tells us when these services are spark are start are um, supposed to run. So the network manager is off for all run levels. We see down here ACP ID for uh, power management is off on levels 0 and 1, 2, and is turned on at 3, 4, and 5. Uh, let me see if there's anything else interested in here. If we just want to see what's running on run level 5, we can of course do this, grip 5 on. And so everything that's on for run level 5 is listed in here then. And so, so to determine what the default is uh, for starting services at a particular level, that may be of interest uh, and have some forensics value. For example, to determine whether somebody is, um, is running an SMTP server or if they're running Snort or uh, Telnet or FTP and so on. So this could be of use to you um, from a network intrusion standpoint. Partition schemes, you need to understand about how partitioning occurs and how it's um, articulated in Linux. <coughs> so of course everything uh, extends from the root directory and then you have various disks that are attached to your computer and you have two controllers of course, you have the primary and you have the secondary on an IDE controller. And so the primary master disk is the first partition is everything in Linux, in Unix of course, is a file and so even the physical devices that attached to your um, computer are represented by files on your hard drive. And so with an IDE controller, excuse me, with an IDE drive, the first partition, the first computer is going to be HDA, and this is correct, this is the first drive. The second partition, okay, and then the first partition on the first drive is dev hda1, there we go, there. And so the first drive is uh, hda if it's an IDE controller, if it's a SCSI it's going to be sda, and the first partition on the first drive is dev hda1. The first partition on the drive if it was a SCSI drive would be sda1, it's hda1 for an IDE hard drive. The second partition is dev HDA2 and so on. Uh, recall that you can only have four primary partitions on a hard drive, so anything after uh, HD3, if you're going to have more than two um, partitions on it, it's going to have to be an extended partition. And then everything after that would be a logical partition. And if we want to go and we want to take a look at this to see what this looks like, we're going to type fdisk-l. This is going to tell us our hard drive configuration. Notice that we have dev HDA here, which is going to be an IDE hard drive. It gives us a size of 8 gigabytes. It tells us that there's two partitions in HDA1, primary, HDA2, primary. Uh, this is our Linux partition that's bootable. And our Linux logical volume manager right here. So on our secondary controller, we um, it's going to be designated, if it's IDE, it's going to be HDB. And so the uh, first partition on there would be HDB1. If it was a SCSI drive, it would be SDB for the, uh, for the hard drive and SDB1 for the first partition. Oops, as it says down here. Okay, got a little ahead of myself. 
Okay, a little something about the uh, about the file system is uh, we look at the permissions that we can see from the uh, from a terminal window from the command line. Is uh, we should already know this, but let's go over this quickly. Is that notice right here in this first line? Let's jump back here. Clear. Let's go up a little bit. A L less. And so notice in here. In the very first column, we have D's right here, which indicates a directory. If it's just a dash right here, it indicates it's a regular file. And then after that are going to be the permissions for the owner of the file, which is going to be root. So read, write, and execute. Read means that, that root can read this, root can write this, and it doesn't have the execute bit set, so it means that uh, root cannot execute this file. Of course, it doesn't need to be because it's not an executable file. Uh, down here, in the next three columns, we have R dash dash. This is for group ownership, which is uh, the group root, which means that the, anybody in the group root can read but can't write or access this file. And finally, everybody else, which would be everybody that's not contained in the uh, uh, root group, can just read this file but cannot write to it or execute it. After this, we see the number of links that are associated to this file. We see it has one link to it. Here is the file size. This is the time that the file was last modified, February 15, 2006, and this is the name of the file. Notice right here we have the dot dot, which means that the parent directory, and the dot here means the current directory, of course, if you recall from your Linux class. Let's go to C home. PC to look at some of this. Okay, we notice that we have the parent directory and the current directory symbology. Here we have different owners in here. Notice that root owns this file called assignment2.dd, which we will see a little later. The file size, the number of links to it. Root can read and write it, but can't execute it, doesn't need to. Uh, the group, root can read it and everybody else can read it. Uh, if we go down here, to let's look at this directory called class. Notice that it's a D indicating that this is class is a directory. Uh, the owner root can read, write, and execute it. This execute bit, bit is needed because in order to CD to that directory, there has to be an execute bit set on each, um, on each directory. So in actuality, it's interesting, if, if you just had, let's say, uh, write and execute set, or just execute, you could actually CD to that directory, but you couldn't read it unless the read permission was also um, set. Notice for group, we have r-x, meaning that, that persons in the uh, group root can read and change to that directory, as well as everybody else can. Hopefully you remember all this from your Linux class. Oh, and that shouldn't be in there. Let's delete that. I've got a better example of that there. Okay. Uh, code values for an inode. Recall this is uh, octal notation. Um, if you recall, uh, UID, set UID is a code which indicates that anybody that's running this program can run it as root. Set GID has an octal value of two, indicating that anybody running this um, can run this as uh, as root as well. The group root. Let's go and find some of these files. Let's go to uh, sbin. Look for some of these files. Uh, we'll see. Notice that the L right here indicates that it's a symbolic link, and so uh, this says that uh, the tell in it is a symbolic link to in it, which, which will be in this current directory. Swap off is a symbolic link to swap on. If we move down here, notice that we have an S right here. So instead of RWX, RWS indicating that anybody that is allowed to execute this file, is, so if we look over here, we see anybody's able to execute it, but that means when they execute it, they execute it as root. And you should remember how all these, uh, the, so the first three is read by owner, write by owner, execute search by owner, four, two, and one. 
and the same for group and for by all others. Now let's look at how the file system is laid out. Under AIX and HPUX, um, the files and the location of the files are going to be slightly different depending on which Unix file system you're, you're using. Um, so we're not going to go too far into this, but you can take a look at this in case you ever do run up against an AIX or an HPUX file. Uh, some of the ones that are similar to Linux we see is UTEMP, which holds the current user's login information. Um, WTEMP holds the login and log off history. So if we go back here, and as root, if we type last log, oops, just type last, there we go. And that information is held in WTEMP. And we see all the, the information where uh, root was logged in TTY2. Notice that that person is still logged in. That was me. Root TTY1 uh, logged in here from 1314 to 1315. That's 1 p.m. for one minute. Notice that PC logged in at, at Monday the 25th at 110 on the um, running X. And I'm still logged in. But it tells you. Um, also, when the system was rebooted, notice this is rebooted right here, and which kernel was rebooted. So this may be some of some forensics value too. For example, if um, if you see that your system is rebooted when it shouldn't be, then that could be a um, that could be an indication that somebody has broken into the computer and is rebooting it so that uh, they can reboot with their own tools. Notice here, this also indicates that some of these were actual crashes. And I don't believe these were actual crashes. I think I was just uh, stopping the VMware um, session and it actually interprets that as a crash. Come on. I know you're a little slow, but you can do it. Okay. Uh, notice, uh, notice that Etsy FS tab has the file system table of devices and mount points. If we go back here, we can't. Etsy FS tab. It shows you the mount points of everything. Notice where the swap file is mounted, the proc file system, which is the pseudo file system which holds the current system information. And that uh, uh, that boot is um, mounted on the boot drive. Um, and FD0, which is the floppy, is mounted on media floppy. And it shows you the defaults and what type of file system each partition or each uh, device is. Uh, checklist um, we don't find in Linux. Exports, Etsy password is where the uh, master password file for the local system is. Recall in Linux the password file system has user information and uh, user and group information and uh, and um, login information, but it doesn't have the master password. The password is going to be located in the shadow file. The Etsy group file contains group membership information, which may be a forensics value. So let's clear this and let's cat the Etsy password file. And we'll see that it has some um, names down here. Here's a regular user right here. X, this is, typically would be where the password is. But since this has to be uh, world readable uh, so, that the, so that the users can change their um, their uh, terminal, or their shell rather, uh, that um, that the password has been extracted and, and put in the uh, shadow file. Here's the UID number 500, the GID number, my real name, where my home directory is located, and the shell that I want to run. Notice that some of these are actually services like SSHD, XFS. I have no idea what some of these are. Um, NTP network time protocol. Notice over here that says SBIN no login. This makes sure that somebody trying to uh, log in uh, using a username of let's say NTP or Apache can't log in because this says SBIN no login. So you can't log in. If we cat the shadow file, notice here the double bangs indicate that, the, that these aren't real users and you shouldn't be allowed to log in. As one of these users. That's why you have the double banks. Uh, down here we have the only one real user outside of root, which will be up here. Root will be at the top usually. Notice this dollar one sign indicates it's an MB5 hash. And we have the same down here. 
and these first two right here will be the um, the salt for this password. And as we move on down here, this shows you more information about the other operating systems. Um, Linux is the one that we'll be concentrating on here since it's uh, available. But you can take a look at that. We've already explained most of that. Uh, recall that the ver log messages hold the system messages log, and so that may be of some interest too. If we want to take a look at ver log messages, it holds a lot of the system logs and it gives you the time and then the message associated with it. And we can move down here. Notice it tells us so. Uh, information about various services and about various things that have occurred um, during the running of the operating system and during the boot time and um, reboot. And so sometime you might want to go through here and search for the word error to determine um, if there's anything going on that shouldn't be going on. So you search for error or fail.